Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to see you all here tonight. Now, your excitement, of course, for this panel is reasonable. Your confusion is also reasonable, given my mask and my obviously diesel good looks. <laughs> you might think I'm someone else. Alas, I am not. Nor can you smell what I'm cooking or would you want to. However, I'm Steve Snyder. I'm the president and CEO of the Fleet Science Center. We're really super excited to have you all here for this panel on the science of Fast and the Furious. Yes, that's the proper response. The Fleet Science Center has been partnering with Comic-Con to do panels like this for a number of years now, mostly because our mission is to realize a San Diego where everyone's connected to the power of science. And we know there is no more powerful gateway drug to science than comic books, science fiction, fantasy, and popular culture. Because everything leads back to science in some way or another, so we're very excited to be doing this. We're also excited this year, not just to be uh, down here at Comic-Con, but also be welcoming Comic-Con to the park. As some of you may know, today was the opening day of the Comic-Con Museum with their first one of opening down in Balboa Park. So if you haven't caught up to see it, hope you get a chance to come up while you're in town. If you're from town, hope you get a chance to see it. And of course, while you're there, you might also choose to visit the Fleet Science Center. Woo! If not for our, yes, yes, if not for our, if not for our great exhibits and programs and great things we do there, maybe for our brand new IMAX Dome Theater projection system. Kick-ass giant lasers on a giant screen. Right now, if you want, if you haven't yet seen, you come up and see Ghostbusters Afterlife. It stars, by the way, apparently the world's sexiest man. <laughs> Go figure. Now imagine that, giant sized, and everything else as well. Um, so please come on down, sit, visit the fleet, visit the Comic Con Museum, come on up. We do have a QR code here. If you snap that, you can get on our 21 and older, our after hours lists to send you all sorts of information about what's going on with the films, uh, new things that are coming up, and great events. So, with that, I'm going to say thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Cassie and enjoy your panel. All right, well, hopefully everyone here is familiar with the Fast and the Furious franchise um, because there will be a few spoilers. Uh, we're gonna start from the humble beginnings of stealing DVD players through sweet jumps to parachuting from planes, driving the world's largest runway, um, and to eventually blasting into space. <laughs> the people and cars go through quite a lot. Uh, we acknowledge that the science here is in quotes. Um, there are plenty of disconnects from reality, um, but it's a lot of fun. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in. We're going to start with uh, Melissa here to the left and uh, just kind of head down the line. Yeah, hi, I'm Melissa Miller. I'm a volunteer with the Fleet Science Center and I'm a science communicator. Uh, this panel was just kind of my idea and so I'm here to just be support and enthusiastic and I'm gonna play some, some clips just for those who may not be up to speed on all the ridiculous things we're about to talk about. Did, did you just say up to speed? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Lisa Will. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at San Diego City Co uh, College and I'm the resident astronomer at the Fleet Science Center. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Kevin Jack Nandin. I'm also at San Diego City College. I'm an associate professor of biology, so I'll be talking about the physiology of some of the acts that we see in these videos. I'm Ryan Sturz, I'm a doctor of gravity. I'm a stuntman. Uh, I fall down. <laughs> I'm the only non PhD in my family, believe it or not, on the black sheet. Um, I, uh, I'm a stunt coordinator also, I'm a second unit director, and I run the Motion Picture Driving Clinic. It says Motion Picture Driving School, nope. that's wrong. It's Motion Picture Driving Clinic, we're on Instagram, and we're building a really cool website that should go live in a couple of weeks. Oh. Hope to see you. <laughs> if you guys ever... Um, yeah, if you ever wanted to drive like Vin Diesel, you can come to us and, uh, and visit. <laughs> I'm Kayvon Bakshande. I have been working at my family's auto repair shop off and on since I was 10 years old. I'm currently getting my master's in mechanical engineering, and during that time I've been a part of teams that have built many Formula One and many Baja cars for competition. <laughs> Yeah. 
So yeah, this is kind of one of the only scenes I think that they wear seatbelts in the entire franchise. Which is kind of weird. Uh, but so I'm going to do my best to try to sell some of these scenes rather than just completely dismiss it. Uh, so they're wearing seatbelts. So when we think about a car crash, really the first thing we have to think about is the absorbing of energy. Right? We're, we're going 100 miles an hour. We're crashing into a stationary object. Where's all that energy going to go into? It's going to go into the car, and it's going to go into the people that are in the car. So when you're thinking about the people that are in the car. And you're thinking about what they're absorbing energy from, it's whatever they come into contact with. If you're wearing seatbelts, that's what you come into contact with. So in this case, if they're wearing seatbelts and they have like the double harness seatbelts, the first thing that's going to come into contact with that seatbelt is their collarbone, so that's usually what's going to be the first thing that breaks or fractures, and then the rib cage, right, so that's where the seatbelt's going to cross. So in this uh, scene, I think Roman, Tyrese's character, says that he breaks his, his arm. I, I can kind of see that, that's okay, that, that's kind of legit. Um, but you probably see some more injuries up in the collarbone and the ribs area. Um, other things that happen with your seat belts is the, 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 the band that goes across like your waist. Usually you want that to cross over the pelvis or the hip so it hits the bones. But if you have it too high and it's across the abdomen, now there's no bone there to protect you. So now it might dig in and cause some internal damage there as well. But, so that all sounds bad, but well, without the seatbelt, it's way worse, and it's a miracle that they survive anything. <laughs> so without the seatbelt, what are you coming into contact with? Instead of a seatbelt, you've got the steering wheel, you've got the windshield, you're going through the windshield, so a lot more damage is gonna happen without the seatbelt. So even though it sounds really bad, with the seatbelt, it could be way worse. Um, the other thing you see is, in this scene right here, uh, Paul Walker's character, Brian, He's holding his head, like the concussion. You can see there's no uh, airbag that came out there. So chances are he hit his head pretty hard on the steering wheel. So definitely a concussion there. And if we were to continue to play it, you would see that he pulls out a gun and tries to shoot somebody. That's not gonna happen if you have a concussion. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not gonna be in that kind of situation at that point. And Ryan, how do you make sure that injuries uh, like that Kevin was just talking about don't happen in onset? You know, Kevin was talking about the absorption of energy and uh, what we do, what we try to do is um, let the car absorb as much of the energy as possible. So with the seat belts, we want to be belted in as tight as possible so that we, we don't get flung around inside the vehicle. Um, as far as the lap belt is concerned, we use something called the submarine strap. It's a strap that goes between your legs and ties into the lap belt to keep the lap belt from riding up. So it keeps the lap belt right on top of the pelvis. Um, the lap belt is really what keeps you in the seat. The uh, shoulder belts are keep you from going forward. We would uh, disable an airbag because an airbag is really like a re basically like a really really hard punch to the face. Um, it can save your life in a real life accident, but it's um, it's mostly uncomfortable. Um, if you crash a car on purpose. Um, sometimes directors want to see the airbag go off and what I would do is I would just hike my seat as far back as possible and um, you know, try to not get hit in the face too hard. Another thing that happens with airbags that's interesting that nobody thinks about is the fact that the airbag material is very, very uh, rough, it's abrasive. It's almost like canvas. And uh, so uh, you might get Rug burn, you know, on your forearms, in your face. It's, it's just, I don't recommend it. Uh, so, um, and one, one more thing, back to uh, sacrificing the car. So if I were to jump a car, the worst landing you could imagine is, or that you could want as a stunt performer, is a pancake landing where the car comes in like this and lands on the rear wheels first and then pancakes down. That's a backbreaker. Um, what we would try to aim for is a nose first landing 
what happens is the nose of the car absorbs the impact, the frame breaks, we talked about this cable, and the frame will break or bend, and that absorbs enough energy that the, uh, that the landing actually becomes very soft. Uh, but the car won't be drivable afterwards, you know, uh, but for, for our purposes, that's what we want. That's what we're trying for. So if you, if you see a car in a movie like the General Lee in the 1980s when they hadn't figured this out yet, if you see them come in like this and land like that, somebody broke their back. Okay. So let's skip all the way to the pinnacle of defying physics. <laughs> Lisa. Where are the springs? I told you numbers don't lie. This is crazy, bro. So Lisa, <laughs> what would it take to get a Pontiac Fiero into space? <laughs> and does the ISS have room for unexpected guests? Uh, 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 okay, so let's see where to start here. Um, so there's a couple things that would have to happen, and I don't know that a Pontiac Fiero can handle any of them. Um, so, uh, so you'll notice. So one of the things that I liked is they, they, they honestly figured out we can't just you know make a Pontiac Fiero go that fast. But rockets are really, they, they, they make whatever they're putting into space undergo a lot of vibrations. So the, the idea of that car actually holding together as it gets up to about, to, in order to get into low Earth orbit, about where the ISS is, which apparently they think of as being like where they can just go to get rescued somehow, um, you have to attain a velocity of about 17,000 miles per hour to go to low Earth orbit. And I'm not thinking the Pontiac Fiero, no matter how much help it has, is probably going to be able to handle that. It's also not um, aerodynamically sound. <laughs> so the, the, the atmospheric friction is probably not going to help it hold together very well. Um, and then the idea of uh, the, 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 does the ISS have room for some people? Okay, so the ISS probably has some room for some people. It would be catching up to the ISS, docking to the ISS, not letting your momentum make you into a bug splatter on the ISS. Uh, those, are, those are a little complicated. I loved every minute of it, though. <laughs> So throughout the franchise, um, they frequently use NOS for all of the vehicles. Kayvon, what is NOS? NOS is just nitric oxide. It's basically laughing gas that dentists use. And it's used because whenever uh, you heat it up to whatever temperature the engines run at, the nitrogen and oxygen will separate so you get more air into the system so you can have more fuel so you get more power. So it just makes uh, the car go faster a bit with uh, adding more oxygen into the system. All right. And uh, Ryan, was NOS used in the stunt vehicles? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, it's just just because of uh, time, you know. Uh, it needs time to set up the car and, and uh, reset it up to run it again. And uh, the speed that we're going on camera is hardly ever as fast as you think. Uh, you know, most of the car chases that we do, we do at 35, 40 miles an hour. And then on the, in the movie, it looks like we're going 100, you know. But uh, that's rarely the case. So for all the drag racing sequences, no, it was just you know regular cars. And I actually did my research. I called Debbie Evans this morning. She's a, she was a stunt driver on the entire um, series. And I asked her just for fun. As a stunt coordinator, I was confident, I could confidently say no. They didn't use NOS in, in the cars. So I called Debbie and she said no, didn't. <laughs> And then um, this one's for both Ryan and Kayvon. How fast can a car go in reverse? Uh, that really just depends upon how the transmission is geared. Uh, for the most part, they don't really go that fast. Uh, I've never actually tested how fast one can go in reverse. Uh, I know. <laughs> 
Yeah, I couldn't include a clip of that because Paul Walker curses throughout the entire time that he does that in the movie, so you'll just have to go back and watch that. I would too. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've gone as, or some cars can go as fast as 25, 35 miles an hour in reverse, and that's very fast. Um, and um, I know I'm stepping on your toes here a little bit, but cars are not really meant to go in reverse. The reason why cars have reverse gears is for parking. That's it. You know, so um, as, so in science or in f uh, physics, there's never, you can't ever have your cake and eat it too. You have to decide what you want, right? And for most of us, we want our cars to go in a straight line, reasonably stable at 80 miles an hour, forward. But that goes to the sacrifice of car stability going in reverse. Driving a car in reverse is like two things. Driving is like riding a bicycle with the handlebars turned all the way around. It's almost impossible to do. And it's like driving a forklift where the steering wheels are in the back. And that makes the car really unstable as well. So it, it, we can practice it, but if we wanted to drive the car really, really fast in reverse, we would probably cheat it. We would probably take the body of the car off the chassis, off the frame, and switch it around and put it back on. So now the stunt driver is hidden. You know, he's looking through a slit um, uh, in the in the license plate or something like that, but he's driving forward.